welcome Dr. Elizabeth Komen. I'm really excited. And you, I'm going to let you do your whole introduction okay. and bio and history and anything you want to say or not okay. say. But what I am going to say that we are mostly going to talk about today is this book, All in Her Head, mm-hmm. which I have been told so many times in my life, which is why when I first got this book and it came to my house, I was like, all in her head. Like, I don't know how many times, literally I've been told that I've had that. And then add the word blonde in there, all in your blonde Mm. head. So this is highly resonating with me and with so many women around the country and the world. Um, So welcome. Thank you. And just give us your your, your, your goods. Wow. I've never, <laughs> what kind of goods that like, I love to dance and yeah. I have three kids. Yeah, totally. I'm from outside Boston originally, or do we want like the academic nerdy version? I want all of it. Okay. Well, I told you the fun part. I love to dance. I love to work what out. What kind of dance? I grew up um, doing hip hop and oh, really? I love Latin rhythms. I love awesome. to salsa dance. I love to work out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've tried probably every exercise, like swing from the trees Same. option. Yeah. Ever. I haven't done pole dancing, oh, but I, I kind of want to. I did it for five years. <laughs> I can give you some you lessons. You have a really strong core. I do. You really do. I That's do. what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. we can do that as another, okay, as yeah, another totally. sidebar. <laughs> um, but yes, I wrote this book all about how women can thrive in their bodies. So mm-hmm. it's all a little consistent. But I'm originally from outside Boston. I went to Harvard, Harvard Med School. I majored in the history of science. And I've dedicated my career to taking care of women with breast cancer. And I'm mm-hmm. a breast oncologist practicing in New York City. And you're also like a medical historian. Yes, that took me some time to actually own. So I majored in the history of science and I'm passionate about, I've always been passionate about understanding how medicine doesn't exist in a vacuum, but inextricably linked to history, culture, politics, religion. And it continued to inform my practice over time because I take care of women, not just in one instant, but throughout their lifetime. And in this real field that requires a dedication to continuity of care and understanding women's experience with illness. And then in writing this book, I spent years reading countless, countless historical texts of women uh, and medical care for women going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, to the Romans, to the Egyptians, all the way through the Middle Ages, European medicine, and then carrying through to testimonies today. So you're just a real underachiever. Okay. I don't know. (laughs) I'm a little tired. I'm a little tired, but passionate about all the work. And amazing. So- I think that's kind of what you were talking about and getting into just in explaining who you are is the crux of this book and Mm -hmm. what you, what you do as a human, which is looking particularly at women as a whole human being and notice knowing that we are not a sum of our parts, but we are like whole Mm -hmm. head to toe Yes, and everything affects everything. Mm -hmm. You know, for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think about women's bodies. When did that click in your head? And then is that part of what drove you down this road? So really going back to college, I'd always been interested in the history of empathy, mm. how that became infused and not infused in medicine, whether that could be taught. And of course, that's more of this feminine spirit of mm. medicine and, and the mind-body connection and all the yeah. things that some of us intuitively experience. And we yeah. probably would have been burned at the stake as witches, <laughs> you know, in the Middle Ages. And then, um, you know, throughout my career, starting actually when I worked in a lab at Dana-Farber, which is a cancer Mm -hmm. hospital. I worked with cancer patients, but they were coming into a boutique Mm -hmm. looking for wigs and breast prostheses. And it really, really showed me that two women can have the same diagnosis of cancer, but what mattered to them in terms of their experience with illness was not just whether they were going to live, but how they were going to thrive and how they looked and how that was really important to how they felt about themselves, that how they looked in the mirror influenced what they saw looking back at them, that reflection really influenced how they were going to live with whatever disease that they had. And so for a very, very long time, I've just been committed to this area of medicine and understanding that Biology, again, doesn't exist in a vacuum, but we have to be able to incorporate all the things that make women feel whole. Yeah. When my mom had cancer um, for five years, she, my mom really took care of her body Mm. and she loved to look good and feel good. It was Mm. a big part of her identity. Mm -hmm. And I cannot think of one thing she cared more about than finding a fabulous wig. Mm. And she took it to a, you know, it's like major hairstylist in LA to have it done. And and I, I was a teenager and I think a part of me thought at the time that that was like ridiculous and maybe superfluous and she should be focusing really on her health. Yeah. But as an adult looking back, I know that that 
she needed that confidence. Of course. And she needed to be able to look in the mirror uh-huh. and then fight what was going on inside of yeah. her. It's It was 100% intrinsically linked. Yeah. It's interesting because I think when I talk to patients and I and some of them, you know, they're wondering, am I going to need chemo? I'm going to mm-hmm. not. It's in their initial consultation mm-hmm. that sometimes we have to break that news. Mm-hmm. I think that's the hardest part of the conversation. Am I going to lose my hair? Am I going to lose my hair? Because that to them signals what they've seen in movies. Mm-hmm. That signals all the imagery associated mm-hmm. with being sick. It means and sick. It means sick. And we don't allow for women to be sick in our society mm-hmm. and to be cared for. No. Even if you look quite pragmatically, we now have these newer ability to, um, we use what's called cold capping, mm-hmm. which allows us to decrease the amount of chemotherapy that can go to the hair follicle. And depending on the chemotherapy, potentially decrease, mitigate um, hair loss. It depends on the chemotherapy regimen. But up until very recently, this was never covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to think really hard about if this were erectile dysfunction or some other quality of life measure, I think this would have been covered a lot sooner and a lot more ubiquitously than we see now. And and women sometimes have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for this. Oh, thousands. I mean, I remember there was an anti-nausea drug that my mom was on. I mean, this Mm -hmm. was in the late 90s Mm -hmm. and it wasn't covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. And... She took it anyways. We were lucky enough that she could, but mm-hmm. it was just unfathomable. Yeah. I just recently had a conversation with a woman whose grandmother had breast cancer and died. Her mother had breast cancer, mm. tested positive for BRCA mutation. Mm-hmm. She wanted to, she's in her thirties. She wanted to get genetic testing mm-hmm. and through her insurance, they wouldn't cover it mm-hmm. and they wouldn't cover it. in because like some nuance, like her mom was still living or the mm-hmm. age of onset And it was so, it was incredibly frustrating, obviously, but she is this incredible young woman who advocates for herself, is really in touch with her body. And she just sort of barreled through, ended up getting covered because she found another family member um, and found out she was, she had a genetic mutation and ended up having um, a prophylactic mastectomy. And I mean, she's like the epitome of taking care of, you know, yourself and advocating for yourself, Mm. but that's a bit of an anomaly from what yeah. I found. Yeah. We make it very hard on, on many, many levels. And certainly uh, the history of genetic testing in this country and what we allow for and don't allow for and cover and don't is a real problem. Yeah. So talk to me about just women and their own, our own ability to advocate, especially when it comes to sitting with our doctors or sitting in a, in a doctor's office or yeah. with anyone in the medical profession and yeah. really why we're so bad at it. Well, I think even taking a bigger, bigger step back, I don't know that we're bad at it. I think we've been told that we don't have the space for it. Right. Right. So the book is really a walk through history and by Mm -hmm. organ system to teach women that women's health is not just about what we've been told, our breasts and our uterus and our reproductive function, but there are very specific disease presentations. There are things that are misunderstood, misdiagnosed whether it's autoimmune diseases that are 80% more common in women Mm -hmm. or the presentation of heart disease or nervous system conditions or the way we exercise or the way our skeleton Mm -hmm. and the way our bones break and Mm -hmm. what we're at risk for. There are so many things that we don't know about women's bodies throughout history and up until today. And I think that relates to what we even imagine we're able to advocate for, Uh, you know? And so there are so many things that we already apologize for. We apologize for sickness. We apologize for the way that we look. We apologize for being in pain. We apologize because we're worried about being a burden. We apologize for the way that we look even to our own doctors. Yeah. And there's so many hurdles, emotional, psychological that happen in the doctor patient relationship because I think of this legacy that we've inherited of shame and blame and taking care of everybody else, but ourselves. Yeah. And so I think first kind of recognizing when and how we do that. And then understanding that women's health is far beyond what we've been told about it just being bikini medicine. It's really head to toe different and we are not small men and we need you know individualized attention to what it means to be a woman. Taking off on we're not small men. One of the things that I was flabbergasted, I think when I learned this was the majority of dosing for medicines mm-hmm. is based on an average male's yeah. body composition. 70 kilogram white male for so many medications. It's like yeah. crazy. <laughs> if you look at the original studies of aspirin or cholesterol medications for heart disease, it's as if we don't have hearts and we don't <laughs> die from heart disease. When heart disease is the number one killer of women mm-hmm. in this country. Mm-hmm. And many of these medications were translated from clinical trials on men with limited inclusion of women, if inclusion of women at all. And that is changing both in preclinical models in terms of how we model disease in the laboratory and then clinical trials, which of course include actual humans, but there's a lot of gender parity to make up for. It was not until 1993 that the National Institute of Health required that their clinical trials include minorities and women. 
And the other part of that is pregnant women. We know so yeah, little yeah. about pregnant women because the the role of pregnant women is to have babies, right? Mm-hmm. But we are almost so afraid of tampering with our role as vessels that we don't even assume that women can have informed consent and join trials based on what they believe is best for themselves. I've never really thought about that. Yeah. The lack of information on pregnant women and what People you can terrified take, to take and care. ingest when you're yeah. pregnant. People are terrified to take care of, you know, I was talking to a pulmonologist and, you know, one of the symptoms, take, for example, pregnant women mm-hmm. who may experience shortness of breath because their uterus is growing, pressing up on their diaphragm and causing decreased lung volume. Mm-hmm. But you can also have shortness of breath from asthma or other causes or a pulmonary embolism, or, uh, you know, you don't want to, be missing symptoms that could be associated with an important diagnosis in a pregnant woman, woman simply because you're attributing it to her growing belly. And during pregnancy, I think in general, you're so scared. Mm-hmm. I mean, certainly if you have multiple children, your first yeah. one to say anything. Yeah. And, and if you do, often it's because it's you're pregnant, mm-hmm. you know, which I think is sort of the overall gist of you're a woman. Yeah. You know, get, we'll move on. Yeah. If you look at the history of women's health overall Mm -hmm. and what we focus on, it's, well, you know, we learn about women going or girls going through puberty and we focus on their reproductive fitness. Mm -hmm. And then the aging woman is sort of this ghost in our healthcare system. It is a ghost. Right. I mean, what about what women need as they age, whether it's menopause or bone strength or how they exercise or brain health, the fact Mm -hmm. that Alzheimer's disease is two times more likely in women than men. And we know so little about it. Why is that? Well, yeah, we know why. Yeah. Lack of funding and attention. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I always like to say, and it's sort of my mantra is women need to know their normal yeah, and know that their normal, their baseline, their sort of stasis Mm -hmm. changes throughout our life. So you, you know, your normal is different than when you go through puberty and then post puberty, that sort of second puberty. And you're Mm -hmm. like 18, 19, 20 years old, Mm -hmm. which of course happens when a lot of girls are away from home for the first time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's even scarier and more foreign in mm-hmm. many ways. Mm-hmm. And then our bodies change throughout our twenties and thirties. Yeah. And so it's knowing that what that normal is as we grow and our bodies change and then mm-hmm. knowing when you're outside of that. Yeah. And then that last piece of advocating for yourself right. and feeling the confidence to say something to the right person and then follow up to make sure someone's listening to you to understand why you might be out of that normal. Not, oh, you're in perimenopause and it might last 12 years. So hang on. Women are told to, I mean, in my field, there's so much shame about just touching yourself in any context, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge advocate for self-breast exams. If you look at uh, women under the age of 40 and breast cancer diagnoses, over 14,000 women under the age of 40 are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. We do not screen routinely average risk women under the age of 40 for breast cancer. Mm-hmm. So that means these breast cancers are largely found by women feeling their breasts. And yet we don't uniformly advocate for this, which I think is a problem. Women have breasts, they're on your body. You should know what your normal feels like. You should go over with your doctor what a normal breast exam looks like so that you can bring to your doctor when you have a concern. Absolutely. I actually have been a, year, a few years ago and it continued into, it's continuing, have a relationship with Playboy Mm-hmm. And I did a webinar for a bunch of women um, who are involved in Playboy. They've been in, you know, I don't think there's a magazine anymore, but they've, you know, been in that world for a long time. And I love it because I think it encourages women to be in touch with their sexual yes. self and to touch yourself, feel yourself. And we had- You're a, speaking my love language. Uh, yeah, What's the, where's the podcast going to go? Touch I'm ready yourself. for it. I'm ready for it. Let's go. <laughs> but a lot of these women were even- <laughs> nervous to do it in that way, yes. you know, to, to, to be able to give yourself a self breast exam yeah. and perhaps looking for something is really, is really scary. Mm-hmm. And, and knowing that, you know, what's going on down here yeah. in that sort of covered region of your lower half of your body, yeah. we own it. It's ours. Of course. If you don't know what it feels like, how can you expect anyone else to know what of you course. should feel like? Of course. And as we know, ovarian cancer gets siloed yeah. as this silent killer. Yeah. I was taught even during my fellowship as an oncologist, that ovarian cancer was a silent killer. It's not silent. My mom had diarrhea for one year leading up to her diagnosis of ovarian cancer when she was 48 years old. Mm -hmm. And her gynecologist at the time told her she was stressed out. So That it was all in her head. It was all in her head. Oh, this is heartbreaking. Literally. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, she 
I'm, I'm sure there was a piece of it. She was stressed out. She had four kids. My dad traveled, all these mm. things. But it's not, and it was normal for her to have, you know, messed up bowels when you travel or when mm. you're stressed, but not for a year. And mm. the idea that she didn't know or enough or thought or have the confidence to go back and say, yeah, this isn't like, this is significantly wrong. Something significantly off here. Mm-hmm. Let's run some tests, do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously it's heartbreaking, but that is true. And, you know, and it's not the silent killer. Nothing mm-hmm. is actually silent if you're really mm-hmm. listening to your body. No. Which is easier said than done. Yeah. And I think every woman has a story like this. Every woman has yeah. a story. Yeah. I, um, you know, at the end of the book, I talk about this injury, running injury that I had, but for three years, I had leg weakness, left lower leg weakness. And I saw multiple different providers who were just kind of like, and I kept, I even said, do I have drop foot? I think I have drop foot. And of course with, you know, a two second exam, it didn't look like that because I had a lot of strength and I was still mm-hmm. running mm-hmm. and powering through and people were like, no, I, I, I don't, I think you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. And it turned out I had a really progressive, progressed nerve that, you know, is, per, is permanently damaged now that probably would not have been yeah. had I continue to say, no, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. But it's hard. You go to multiple different providers. You think that they know what they're talking about. You don't want to question somebody else's judgment, even as another doctor to doctor. It's overwhelming. So I I wonder how the average woman manages. And we're, you know, this word hysteria and women, it's like, it's like connected. Of course. Why? Well, the word hysteria (laughs) comes from the Greek word for womb, right? And so going all the way back to um, Hippocrates and the Greeks, the idea was that this wandering womb was the source, (laughs) literally wandering was the source of all our medical ills. And and even the Egyptians thought, well, you could put different smelling things around the nose versus the vagina. This would reposition the womb. Mm -hmm. And of course, once we knew throughout history and anatomy that, okay, the uterus doesn't wander, other things took over. So it was the ovaries that made us crazy. And Mm -hmm. maybe it's not the ovaries. It's even worse news than that. It's not just an organ. It's the, it's the estrogen. (laughs) And estrogen is bathing every aspect of your body from your brain to your GI system, to your muscles. And that's why we are lesser, inferior, more emotional, and impossibly hard to understand. Yeah, because we're hysterical. Yes, yes. Most of the time. Exactly, and that (laughs) diagnosis wasn't even removed from diagnostic criteria till the 1980s. Really? (laughs) That late? I don't think I was aware of that. Yeah, you could still have a hysterical diagnosis. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Literally crazy. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed a good friend of mine and we were talking, we were reminiscing, um, my older sister's best friend who I've known since I was like 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And we were reminiscing how when she came home from college and she had gained weight and she's like Mm -hmm. a tiny human, she's Mm -hmm. like five feet tall or average. She normally is like 95 pounds and she probably put on 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. That the, in Los Angeles, in West Los Angeles Mm -hmm. at the time, there was this nutritionist that everyone Mm -hmm. went to my mom went to her when, you know, any one of my three, two sisters, any one of us, you know, were like out of shape, you know, you had to see this woman. And we were laughing about her biggest sort of thing that she was like an advocate of was to take peanut butter, turn it upside down with a paper towel, drain all the oil out of it and put it on like a wasa cracker. And that was like your snack and maybe your meal replacement. It's like chalky, disgusting. And she looked like, do you remember that show? I don't remember what it was called. It was Skeletor. Mm -hmm. She looked like Skeletor. I was so scared of her. She like was emaciated. She probably looked 30 years older than she actually was. Like she was a scary looking woman. And this was what the, I sort of what we, what we were supposed to be and what we were supposed to strive for. And when we got older, we were teenagers, like, this is how you you want to look, kind of this, like, emaciated, frail woman. Mm-hmm. And I always poo-pooed it because I was, like, disgusted by chalky, oilless peanut butter and wasa crackers. But also that that we were supposed to, like, not, and I've always had a muscular build, that we were supposed to, like, get rid of this muscle. And we were supposed to, we talked about earlier, you know, have workouts that didn't bulk you up, that kept you like really long and lean Mm -hmm. without any scientific backing and knowing Mm -hmm. that that is important for our aging process. Mm -hmm. Like if we don't have muscle mass, 
you're like a weakling. Mm-hmm. You're, it's not a beautiful mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. How do, I mean, where does that come from? I'm stuck on one thing when you talk about the Wassa crackers. <laughs> in the GI chapter, I go over Kellogg and Graham. Yes. You know, the history of yes. Graham crackers. I have, it, I have it in here. Yeah, and I have developed the, so we don't masturbate. That nutritionist name in here because She's that's what reminded me of her. Very unfulfilled in her life with very. those Wassa crackers. <laughs> That's so all gross. I can think about. <laughs> I'm like, her and Graham would have been besties. Don't right? touch yourself. Don't touch yourself. Kellogg Don't. was celibate. Oh, so yeah, the cornflakes dude was celibate. And, really? Yeah. And promoted basically 15 enemas a day with yogurt. Oh. He had this sanitarium called the San. And all these famous people would go there. But it primarily was about purity and the early version of a colonic to detoxify your, your soul. Okay, I yes. need to like sidebar, <laughs> sidebar, but I could not get the imagery that. of the of the cracker and Graham. Yes. I, we were just circling in the history. Yeah, um, I mean that chapter is literally where I put that note. Yeah, it was like, but I think I think you're really speaking to this thread throughout history, this through line mm-hmm. of the ideal woman is being more frail, less taking up of space yeah. where the idea is us being small mm-hmm. and not strong and mm-hmm. behaving in that contained space yeah. was largely where men wanted us to be societally. I mean, when we spoke earlier today, you said, you know, that sort of heroin chic. Yeah. And I mean, if you or think- Or Ozempic chic now. Ozempic chic, right? So if you, if you like take a moment to think about that right now, yeah. that is so, it is the opposite of healthy. It yeah. is the opposite of- thriving yeah. and in my opinion, beauty and strength mm-hmm. and the ability to get through your life. Mm-hmm. I mean, how it's, it just blows my mind that we have a new version. Yeah. And so many women are looking not to enjoy the food that can yeah. provide them sustenance. Yeah. And whether it's fasting or being emaciated, we have not really evolved in so many ways. We talk about like thick thighs save lives and all these things, (laughs) but I don't think we actually manifest that in what we guide women from a medical standpoint. In my practice, so many women are focused on being thin, but don't understand the relationship of metabolic fitness Mm -hmm. from muscle to fat ratio Mm -hmm. would be more concerned about getting into their size two genes than being able to lift their groceries. Yeah. And as a result of that, particularly- their kids or their grandkids. And as a result of that, when they go through breast cancer treatment and their bone density is already compromised, they're working with a lower bone density because they've never strength trained in their life. They're more at risk for fractures and falls Mm -hmm. and poor mobility Mm -hmm. and imbalance. And it's Mm -hmm. heartbreaking. And we don't know how to coach them. Why we also don't teach medical students, certainly when I was in school, anything about exercise and nutrition, particularly is tailored towards women. And we still don't. And to me, those two things, exercise and nutrition are really pillars of preventive care Yes, and teaching nutrition as a way to sustain your body. Mm -hmm. And and you don't have to be crazy about it, but to know what's nutritious and everybody's different. Mm -hmm. So, but to know what works for you and where to get literally nutrients from the ground and the trees into your body. Yes. And I think we've taught for so long, myself included, drank this Kool-Aid of like, okay, fruits and vegetables are really important and yes. a plant-based diet is really important. We also have to make sure, particularly as women age, that they're getting enough protein. Yeah. And that was never really part of the dialogue at all. If anything, it was, you know, well, don't ever eat red meat. You're and not going to eat a eat, burger. <laughs> yeah. To eat dainty food. And I'm yeah. not a huge fan of red meat and processed meats at all for, you know, cancer risk reduction, but there's other ways to get protein. Yeah. And I've had to learn that myself very recently that, you know, it's not just about eating a salad and, and eating other things to not feel full. It's also what, what are you eating that actually helps the building blocks of your body and support uh, them? Yeah. One of my kids has IBS And it just started in his twenties. And I talked to him a lot about, see how much, you know, he actually is digesting part Mm -hmm. of the, part of the pun, but Mm -hmm. that building strength Mm -hmm. and muscle and eating Mm -hmm. the right foods Mm -hmm. can help him when he's in an episode so that Mm -hmm. he's strong going into it. And to me, that's, that's preventive care. Like that is, you can't control everything, but what you can control is your, you know, two things, your diet and your nutri- in your exercise routine mm-hmm. and being strong, not just in case something bad happens, yeah. but being strong feels better. Yeah. It feels better. You will look better, but it just gives you a different 
path in life. Yeah. Well, the strong woman was a scary woman yeah. in history. Yeah. When um, Superwoman. Yeah. She's scary. Yeah. The, the beginning of the muscular chapter talks about the history of bicycle riding. Yes. And how, it's my favorite chapter. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Um, just And I didn't even know about this history. And yet it was so pervasive where medical journals were going back and forth with doctors as moral arbiters of how women could and could not exercise with the fear that really instilling fear that riding a bicycle would be dangerous for women, for their reproductive fitness, for their aesthetics, for their muscles, for their sexual libido, it would just turn them into these wild women. I, I found this picture that when Cambridge University in England was looking to have co-ed education, mm -hmm. do you know how they protested that? The men protested by putting a woman, an effigy of a woman um, hanging from a window on a bicycle. What? So it just shows you the cultural implications of what yeah. exercise, mobility meant for women throughout history, including not so long ago. And what's amazing to me about a bicycle too is, I mean, I remember when my kids could learn, learn to ride a bike, it was freedom. Yeah. They were free to bike off. Mm -hmm. Like they could get up the street much more quickly and away yeah. from their parents. Yeah. And or women away from their husbands exactly. or their family. And so that not just is stripping the idea of exercise and wellness, it's literally taking freedom away. Yeah. This idea that you can you can move on your own. Well, the free woman is a scary woman. The free woman is a scary woman. Yeah. It's I mean, I guess this is how we change that narrative over time mm -hmm. and we talk about it and we try to get to not just younger generations, but all generations, of you know, women who get older. 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, we live a long time, need just as much of this, you know, this knowledge and this wealth of information to take care of themselves mm -hmm. because you want to be, you know, until I said to my kids the other night, I'm like, until the day I die, I want to be able to be as healthy as possible. Yeah. I don't want to be, I actually don't want to be frail. You know, I don't mm -hmm. want to be that picturesque woman that of so long ago mm -hmm. because, then you can't do anything. You know, yes, then you're sort of, of course. <laughs> and your life is basically over. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's- Yes, who takes care of women as they age? Nobody. Right. Absolutely no one. Mm -hmm. You know, They're putting, girlfriends. They're girlfriends, 100%. Mm -hmm. if sisters, if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And it's that putting your mask on first, like you said, yeah. and I've said for so long, you, you have to. You know, we're told you have to do that on an airplane, but in life, like mm -hmm. you have to put your mask on first. Absolutely. You're singing my- <laughs> Singing my tune there. <laughs> so just to finish up on what we spoke about this earlier this morning too, this, my, one of my favorite parts, other favorite part besides the bike riding sort of chapter in there is vaginal health. Yes. And the idea that we are as women, because we menstruate, we're mm -hmm. unclean Yes, and anything we can do to clean ourselves mm -hmm. and smell fresh as a daisy mm -hmm. is a good thing mm -hmm. where in fact it is kills good bacteria. You know, douching is, I mean, it's so bad for you. And it's, I mean, it, it wrote in your book, like the early forms of it, probably still on the shelves today are filled mm -hmm. with Lysol, like mm -hmm. literally Lysol, Lysol directly Lysol. advertised to women to use their products as douche material. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrific. And these ads, That's, I wish I had had pictures as part of the book, but the yeah. ads are really unbelievable. Like, oh, she looks so, she's such a fine woman, but she's going to lose her husband because she neglected her feminine hygiene. It's really, I mean, in so many different versions of this. And I think it's an extreme example about how women are shamed about their normal bodily functions, whether it's sweating, yeah. whether it's hair growth. Yeah whether it's menstruation, whether it's normal vaginal discharge. I mean, mm -hmm. most women don't even know what normal is for them because yeah. they're so afraid to even talk about it. Yeah. That's not okay. Yeah. That's not okay. And we have not built a system that allows women to talk openly, confidently, and, and vulnerably about what they're concerned about. And you talked about knowing your normal. It's yeah. so important. It's so important. And we have not allowed for that dialogue, whether Absolutely in private haven't. spaces or in the doctor's office. No, we haven't. We absolutely haven't. And menstruating is the most powerful thing yeah. uh, that any like man or woman, we ha we that because we menstruate, we can have babies. Like we can grow humans in mm. our bodies and we push bleed them out. and we don't die. No, we literally bleed. I mean, some months you're like, I'm dying here, <laughs> but we don't, you know, mm -hmm. it's this incredible biology in our bodies mm -hmm. that somehow we are literally ashamed of. I mean, mm -hmm. Still to this day, maybe because I have three teenage boys at home who like everything's funny, but if I bring tampons home from the market, like 
they go straight to my bathroom in my, in my cabinet. Like I don't leave them out on the kitchen counter with all the other stuff that I brought home that don't have time, I don't have time to put away. I mean, maybe do an experiment. I should, I'm going to leave them out. I think one time I did. And one of my kids was like, that is so disgusting. I was like, it's actually not, but Sure, Maybe I bring them to them. the supermarket or the store. <laughs> I'm going to send like, them I to forgot, go get them for me. <laughs> forgot, can you go grab these for me? Yeah, yeah. I think I will. Mm-hmm. Really, to like supporting their mom. Their, yeah, supporting their mom. Which I, you know, it's like my mantra, and somehow that even that piece of it. Mm-hmm. And as I was saying earlier, I mean, the number of times in my life, really not so much recently, that I have apologized to my gynecologist mm-hmm. for showing up to an appointment you know, not recently waxed. Honestly, I've apologized for not having a, like a new pedicure. We all have. It's, it's Join the party. Yeah. And she says exactly what I've heard you say, which is we don't care. Like we're yeah. not looking and judging you for that. Like this is, it's like a dental cleaning. I don't show up to the dentist and say, you know, sorry, I have plaque. Like I just do. And yeah. they deal with it. They yeah. don't care. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more. And I've apologized for all of that. And then some. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I've never. It's not like I wrote this book and had no awareness of what these issues were (laughs) as a patient. I've done it all myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's really figuring out how to stop that cycle. Yeah. And we got to make a pact not to apologize. Make a pact not to apologize. I've actually tried really hard to stop apologizing so much for everything in my life. Oh. How's you know, that working out for you? It's not great. <laughs> uh, my last therapy appointment, my doctor, therapist kept saying, stop apologizing. Stop I saying, know. I'm sorry, but he's like, what are you sorry about? And I was like, yeah. nothing. Existing, he's like, why do you say know. you're sorry? Yeah. It's terrible. I know. I, I don't know. know why I do it. It's really a, yeah. it's such a, it's such a female thing. I mean, mm-hmm. I just never hear any men I've heard start off apologizing for all sorts of things. Even when they're late, you mm-hmm. rarely hear I'm so sorry I got caught. It's just like, we just sat down. Now mm-hmm. we start. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's kind of mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing. And I think this other idea of being, you know, this an advocate to say what it is that's going on and not being thought to be hysterical. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's- We've been told everything. so much like, oh, you're just so great. Like, they're crazy. Like, yeah. She's so emotional. What if the emotion she's is- She's so our, annoying. Yeah. What if our emotion is our superpower? Yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. We are emotionally more intelligent and in touch. Yeah. That should be our superpower. Yeah. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many things that we just sort of like just bury through that we just sort of go through. Mm -hmm. You know, I get migraines and I just sort of work through them. I don't like deal with it. I may deal with it, but I don't stop. My, My life doesn't stop. And I think that's because I, I'm like, how could I? What will happen around me? Yeah. Everything will crumble. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of endurance and suffering that women have been told that they need to do. Yeah. And some level of that is good, right? Yeah. Some level of strength to power through mm-hmm. hard things, but there's a level of pain and suffering that far too many women endure, especially compounded for minorities in our healthcare system oh, yeah. that has to stop. A hundred percent. So what was the best part of writing this book? Like what has oh. been the highlight? I know you're exhausted right I'm now. I'm not tired. And <laughs> no. That was like, a, did I look tired? No, but joyful. I mean, I'm, I don't mean exhausted. I mean, I know you've no. been like everywhere no. and running around no, no, no. and, but and no talking one's about that. it. But what's no. been the best part? Honestly, uh, three things. Number one, I loved doing the research. Mm, I, I you were going to say that. I love history. There's yeah. over 800 citations in this book. Yeah. And um, we had to stop numbering them and not put them at the end of the book because it would have been an entire other book. Yeah. And I was really neurotic so that history of science professors, if they were coming for me, <laughs> everything they were is in there. Yeah. Every reference going all the way back to the 17th century, whatever yeah. it is, it's in there. I loved these discoveries. And I also loved thinking about these poor women who had no voice and how do I give them some dignity back? I don't Mm. know what they would have thought. They seemed, they went through torturous treatments. They were completely invalidated. They weren't heard. And they, some of them died horrific deaths. How do I honor that? And it was a passion project of mine to think about who they might've been and honor their legacy. Secondly, medicine is really hard to practice. Mm. It's very hard to practice today. There's enormous pressure. I'd love to spend an hour with each patient, but I get very little time. Mm. That's just the construct of medicine as it is today. And writing this book allowed me the experience of reminding myself why it is such a calling, why I care about caring for women Mm -hmm. so much and taking a bigger step back to think about not just about breast cancer, but the broader issues that women face. And as a result of that is the third reason, which is that in addition to talking to patients with all different types of diseases, I got to reconnect 
with doctors and other specialties. Mm -hmm. Medicine is an incredibly powerful, sacred field. And I've done one aspect of that my whole life, and that's breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But I got to talk to amazing cardiologists, gastroenterologists, and honestly, mostly like, not that I didn't interview men and feature them in the book as well, but predominantly like-minded women Mm -hmm. where we said, oh my God, we are sharing these experiences and we never get the chance to talk. So that cross-pollination, that cross-validation of our experience, both caring for women, but also our experience as physicians was really validating. A lot of women talk about being the mom consult Mm. in their specialty, that we are the ones who can handle the difficult patient or the patient that needs more listening, right? Mm -hmm. We know that female physicians listen longer Mm -hmm. than male physicians. There's something wrong with that. Men can do that too. Men can be empathic. It's not about a war of the sexes, but it's the assumption that we will provide that tender, loving care. But that has a lot of burden on our healthcare system. When you look at who burns out, right? The women are burning out more because there's less flexibility and they're being asked to do much more of the emotional labor of being a doctor, just like we do the unpaid emotional labor historically and traditionally in our homes. Mm -hmm. So the chance to talk to other women and hear their experiences on every aspect of the doctor-patient relationship was really rewarding. That's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. What are you going to do for your next one? Oh, (laughs) I would like to be part of a movement to help teach future medical students Mm -hmm. and and be part of the mission to move the needle towards more equitable care. And secretly, I can't wait to write another book again. It was such a joyful experience. I have lots of ideas and uh, I got a You're not a one-time author. I don't think so. Definitely (laughs) not. No, I don't think so. I would love to do it again. And there's so many different ways you can impact people's lives and different ways to find your purpose and then branch out. And I think as... The lovely part of, I for me, you're like end of 30s and 40s as mm-hmm. a woman yeah. is the confidence to. I'm coming out. Yeah, literally. The, yeah, yeah. It's kind and of a theme to, song. Yeah, and yeah. to to touch people in different ways. Yeah, and and not just pivoting, but like swerving back and forth mm-hmm. and into different little drop zones. Mm-hmm. I think is part of our superpower too. Yeah. Well, I think it's hard. There's a lot of pressure on women, especially yeah. as they're younger, to follow very traditional paths. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to take a little bit of time to find your own voice and yeah. be confident in what that voice is professionally yeah. and personally. Yeah. It's definitely taken me some time. Yeah. And balancing it is, you know, I'm is not. endless. I mean, that never really like mm-hmm. how it works, but there's ways to figure it out that work yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, and that changes constantly, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Such this a pleasure. Was- so fun and so incredible and you are just you know a badass woman yeah well next time we're pole dancing apparently giddy (laughs) up i don't think my core is strong enough but it would get there i'll help you i'll push you up (laughs) thank you so much my pleasure